Round holes. Machinists the world over love them. Can't get enough. Did you know in the English language alone there are over three ways to say hole? That's not even counting the ventriloquism way. Although I've been excited to discuss round holes with you, sitting here in front of the camera, I worry it might be a bit of an advanced topic. Instead of getting ahead of ourselves, let's start off with something simpler. Not round, round holes. In particular, square round holes. This video may end up a bit dark. I tripped over one of the only two lights that I own and smashed it to pieces. We've broached the subject of not round holes before, quite recently actually. This tool, as shown, does a pretty good job of making hexagonal holes, or hexagonal for you worldly types. But I need a square hole of a very particular size. However, I don't have a square brooch. Perhaps you're starting to see the pickle I'm in. Before we start wading neck deep in the finer points of rotary broaching, let's recap the big picture. There are a lot of ways to make not round holes. And by a lot, I mean two or three. This is the vice handle I made many moons ago. I started off with a round hole and filed it square. Not my first time doing that, probably won't be my last, but always stinks to do. This motley mix of shapes also started out as round holes and were also opened up with a file, but were done on a filing machine. This is my thousand pound filing machine. Not to be confused with this thousand pound filing machine. And this is my two pound rotary brooch. Fun fact, these two things cost me about the same price. Mostly because everyone wants one of these and no one wants one of these. These two pieces of equipment aren't always interchangeable. Meaning the filer can't always do what a rotary brooch does and a rotary brooch can't always do what a filer does. Which is why I have both. Still doesn't cover 100% of my bases, not by a long shot, but better than nothing. Fortunately, for my immediate and pressing square hole making needs, the rotary brooch should do nicely. Meet me back at the bench. So yes, rotary brooches are expensive, but if you're patient, you can get lucky and come across them used, or you could build your own. They're really not that hard to make if you have a lathe and some patience. Search for DIY rotary brooch or brooch plans and see for yourself. Mine came with some hex brooches. By came with, I mean I had to pay for those too. You just put in the size you need and go to town. Now, try as I might, I could not manage to get any of these hex brooches to make a square hole. So I'm going to have to make a square brooch. This, my friends, is where our journey begins. This particular brooch uses half inch shank tools. That is half inch diameter. I have plenty of half inch broken or burnt up end mills and some half inch high speed steel blanks. These brooches are all exactly the same length. That consistent overall length is very important to the operation of this thing. And for now, I think it would just be easier to start with a high speed steel blank than try to carve that chunk out of the center of an end mill. I think my first step will be to cut a square on the end of this of the size that I need. Maybe a little more square than that. Technically, what I'd like is a half inch square brooch. I can't fit that in a half inch round. For now, I'm gonna try something smaller, seven millimeters, and see how that goes. Then maybe we'll tackle the bigger one. Challenge number one, if you've spent any time around high speed steel, you might know this stuff is tough to get along with. It's extremely hard. For you numbers people, this is probably a Rockwell high 50, low 60. That would be off the charts if the scale stopped at 40, but it doesn't. No! no. No! No! Boy, this guy is dumb. Yes! Behold, my digital friends, what you see before you is a classic, this old Tony, no compromise, mediocre setup. And that's putting it mildly. This isn't necessarily the wrong way to do it, but there are better ways. I could have come up with a lot worse, let's put it like that. The high speed steel is mounted in a square collet block because I want to make a square. If I wanted to grind a butterfly shape, I'd be using my butterfly shaped block. That's what we call science. 
As if wanting a square isn't enough, I also need to add some taper, some back relief. I need the business end of the square to be the biggest part, and the rest to sort of taper away. Ideally, I think I'd need about a one and a half degree clearance angle, but I'm using my angle blocks, and I don't have a one and a half degree block. I've got a one and a two and a three, but no one and a half degree. So I'm using the two. One would be too little, and three would be Colin Furs. And that's a slippery slope. So the blank in the collet block sits on the angle block. So it's tipped the right way to give me the relief that I want. And they're both clamped in my grinding vise. Vise is held firm to the magnetic chuck. The chuck is currently on. It's not going anywhere. The magnetic chuck is bolted to the table. The table is attached to the grinder, which is bolted to the ground. The ground is attached to the earth, which is an insignificant speck hurtling through cold, empty space. And there's what it looks like. Not too bad, I don't think. It's square. Dimensionally, it's right on. I gave it about 5 thou extra. I do regret not giving it a little bit more, but that's what we do these little test runs for, I guess. Anyway, next up is to add some clearance to the face, to the business end. I've got to sort of dish out the front a bit. If you take nothing else away from watching this channel, remember, to be a hobby machinist, you gotta know how to dish it out. And this might not be it, but we'll try. The blank I just squared is now loaded in the spindexer. The vise is gone and it's clamped to the magnetic table not going anywhere. That's a resin bonded diamond wheel. Not the best option, but it's the smallest diameter that I have. And it's not in great shape, so I'm not worried about ruining it. Feels like I'm doing nothing. Oh no, I think something's happening. It's not a very deep dish. Unfortunately, dishing it out sometimes entails raising your voice. This is a tool post mounted die grinder with a cutoff wheel. This is a smaller diameter than I would have liked, but it's the biggest I've got for this tool. You may be wondering, this old Tony, isn't that going to get abrasive material everywhere? On the latheways, in the chuck, in your hair? Well, yes. Yes, it will. One of these two is a store-bought hex brooch. The other one is a homemade square. Can you guess which is which? I ground in a small flat for the set screw on the rotary brooch and just broke the sharp corners. Spun on a little bit of a chamfer. And then just honed the business end on a bench stone. Nothing left to do but... I don't know if the same rules apply for square brooches as they do for hex brooches, but for a hex, the pilot hole is drilled, I think, 3% over the flat-to-flat -flat dimension. So this is roughly 3% bigger than 7 millimeters. Closest drill I have is a 932nd. Scratch that. I just looked it up. For square brooches, it's 10%. Since I don't have a 7.7 millimeter drill, the closest match is a letter N. Well, it's squarer than it was before. That went in pretty easy. Makes me wonder if I could have gone a bit tighter on the pre-drill, stuck with my 3% instead of moving to 10%.
Fast forward three minutes, and I cut a small taper along the length. There's the square socket that was just broached, and the rest of it is turned very similar to the handles we did on the tap wrench. Now I'm just gonna try to put a small, tight bend in the end of this, turning it into one of those old-timey wrenches you always see at flea markets and never knew what they were for. I'm gonna heat this with the torch, and to keep that socket from buckling, I'm gonna use my two-in-one old-timey wrench bending jig. The jig is already set for about 45 degrees. And there it is. I should have probably found a different color scotch bright to film against. I just wire brushed it and gave it the old cold blue treatment. Let's go see if it fits. Well, yes, I do leave my die filer running all the time. This filer uses these seven millimeter square head grub screws to hold the files in this collet sort of thing, and then the file holder in the machine. Since all my files have different tapers back at the tang, I have to constantly adjust them to get them to run true, which isn't a big deal, of course. Until now, I've been using these cute little seven millimeter Craftsman, these might be ignition wrenches, but this is the second one I'm on. I had two sets, I lost the seven millimeter, who knows where that ended up, somewhere in the die filer clockwork probably, but I thought it'd be fun to make a custom wrench for the machine. Could I have just changed out all these adjustment screws to hex head? But you know what's really cool? This wrench is now slightly magnetic, so I can stick it anywhere on the machine and never lose it again. Boy, this guy's dumb.